Welcome. You are listening to the East Coast Sisterhood Podcast, where women are inspired, encouraged, and loved. If you are a woman, you are sisterhood. It's not about what you do. It's about who you are and who we are called to be as daughters of God. Hello, and welcome to the Sisterhood Podcast. I'm your host, Jeannie Terry. Today, we're talking about hospitality. And today, I have with me two hostesses with the mostesses that I'm going to introduce to you shortly. But first, I want to give you a verse about hospitality. It comes from 1 Peter 4, 9 through 10 in the NIV. And it says, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Today, I want to welcome Cindy Holtzberger and Angela Cook. Welcome, ladies. Hi. Hi. These two women, uh, since I have known them, have always been graciously willing and generously opening their not only their hearts, but their homes to strangers and turning them into guests. And I was one of them. Cindy, you remember I met you actually at a small group study that you had in your home. So, and I've just been forever blessed by going to your home multiple times for multiple different studies. And I've seen you there as well, Angela, being, you know, just again, the hostesses with the mostesses. So (laughs) welcome to the show, ladies. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Um, If you could start by just quickly introducing uh, each other. And can we start with you, Cindy? Sure. Introduce Angela. Yes. No. This is my daughter, Angela. (laughs) This is my daughter, Angela. (laughs) Yes, I am Angela Cook. This is my mom, Cindy Holzberger. There we go. And we are, um, what, 20 years apart? Exactly. She's my 20 year counterpart and person in crime. Really? Yes. Yes. Yeah. She's taught me everything about friendship and hospitality Mm -hmm. and being a good mom and a good wife. So she has displayed Titus too well. Let's talk about that. Take us back to the beginning. What, what have you learned and how far back does this go, Angela? Oh, my whole life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my mom has met my mom's whole family has been their partiers and they enjoy having a party. I make fun saying we would find if someone loses a tooth, they would (laughs) find a reason to celebrate. And I think as we've added kids to our mix over the last several years, it's kind of slowed that down um, because it just, the more, the more people in a little house, you know, the more hectic, but we still find ways to celebrate everything. Um, It goes back all the way. My mom and I were talking about last week or the other day, um, grandma and grandpa always having people over and how did this tradition with Christmas parties start? And every year we have this huge Christmas party with our family and literally my entire life, like every year. And now we don't even live near each other. They live, our family lives in Jacksonville. We live here, have for years and we travel there. They travel here. Um, we've weddings, parties, just anything we can do to be together. And she said that it basically started, my mom comes from a family of um, nine kids. And so my grandma obviously had to find ways to keep her kids together. So she said Christmas Eve parties just started. And we used to have them on Christmas Eve. That had to change because people just don't have time for that. (laughs) Um, And she just said, that's how it started, just their family. And it just grew and grew and grew. And I can remember family reunions with my mom's family and Um, just a lot of fun and it helped us stay close and keeps us close to our cousins. And a lot of people don't have that privilege of knowing their family, the way we know our family and immediate family, like first cousins, second cousins, third cousins. And so, um, yeah, it's my entire life. It's been like that. And so what has it meant to you to be able to follow and carry that tradition down and that, Is it a gift of hospitality or was it just something that was kind of transferred to you that you just enjoy so you want to keep it alive? Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, and. Either one. Well, I think, yeah, with her, with hospitality, I would say, would would you say it started out as a gift or something you enjoyed doing? Well, it's something that you kind of grow up with. It kind of is part of who you are. So it's kind of like you don't really think about it even as a gift. It's like, you're that's who you are like my family that's the way they were and you just I don't know I just always feel like like even now I got like there's 16 in our family even now that are 18 now 
And we, we still do that. We get together for all the holidays, all the birthdays, all the teeth that are lost. <laughs> we'll celebrate it. You know, it's just like a way of life, I guess you kind of can say it, you know. But then when you look at gifts and stuff, yes, it is it is a gift too because sometimes you don't even know your gift and you're doing it, you know, because it makes you feel so good to do that. And that's your gift. And then when you learn about gifts, you think, oh, now I know why that's my gift because I love it so much. <laughs> you know, so... Kind of something like that, you know. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. I think it starts out as the hospitality, I believe, starts out as something you just do. Hmm. Oh, well, this is just what our families used to do. I personally don't necessarily love, I don't know if I have the full gift of hospitality. And maybe I ebb and flow out of it, um, but I just see the benefits of it. And so I see my husband's family, for instance, really never, they were kind of isolated from the rest of their family because they moved to Florida, their families in Tennessee. Um, And I just saw what a difference that made in my life versus his life. When we got married, his family really didn't spend a lot of time together. And I just think that's so valuable because even when you don't want to spend time together, um, you do, and then your relationships thrive. But I think in doing in like walking out hospitality, just as something to do, you realize, like she said, the gift that might be there in you. And then I do believe, even if you don't necessarily possess the gift of hospitality to understand the importance of the gift of hospitality, as it pertains to um, our Christian life and being believers and what it means to be a believer, hosting the gift of hospitality Mm -hmm. um, in your own life. I think then as you become, as you're a believer and you walk through that, you recognize the importance of that. What does that look like? I, I like that you brought that up. What does the, what is being hospitable or showing someone hospitality, hospitality look like in your Christian walk? What does that look like? Yeah. Um, just like you mentioned, you came over to my mom's house for a Bible study. And so she had to be willing to open her home to inviting people in. She didn't know you. Um, I think your mom came. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Your mom was yeah. there. Yeah. And just thinking about having your mom there and just the women who have come into this house over the years. Um, it's about, as a believer, it's about imparting the gift of Jesus to people. And at church, we have our mission, one savior, one step, one soul. And we talked about how how does hospitality fit into this idea of one savior, one step, one soul? Well, it's hard to fit it into that one savior. um, If you're just like, Oh, it's just having people over. What does that have anything to do with Jesus? Well, because you never know who's walking through the door who may not know Jesus Mm -hmm. um, or who may have heard of Jesus, but they haven't, they don't know him. They don't know him as savior. And so, I mean, I think hospitality has played a part for you, that's been your heart. It has been for years. I've just the word, the way I love the word. I just feel like I want everyone to have that. Like, so when I get an opportunity to like have something like, like anything, a Bible study or freedom or whatever, you know, I know there's going to be somebody. And I've had, there's a lot of stories I have about women that have really stepped out and come just because they see that, you know, there's somebody willing to do it, you know. A lot of people just don't really feel comfortable being in their home with others, you know? So that's kind of like how it works. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, what if, what if you're inspiring me to be more hospitable, but I'm not ready to just dive in and open my home to complete strangers. There's like, I need to maybe instead of diving into that, I would just want to dip my toe into hospitality. What would you recommend that I do? I'd probably say like, just step out in faith and sign up one time for something and watch somebody else first, how they do it. And then if you feel like opening up your own home, say, you know, well, this is all it takes. And then maybe talk to the host and say, I'd really like to do this too, you know? So, I mean, that would kind of be how I'd start out. That's good. That is good. I would have said that too. I would have said, go be with someone who you know is really good at it. And that goes back to that Titus two idea um, that the older women are to show the younger women how to, and that's one of the things, um, how to handle their home. And so if you're a younger woman or you don't have to be a younger woman, but you see someone who has, a, you clearly can see they have the gift of hospitality. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Go latch on to them and help. Even if you don't want to open up your home, help them when they open up their home, right. help them host and watch. I actually have a friend her name's Sharon Clark. She like is literally the hostess with the mostest. Yeah. Um, always has been, you know, Sharon yes. always has been. And when you go into her home and she has stuff everywhere, like she just, she, she gathers things just to bless other people. And you'll go into her home for a party or for a Bible study. And she always has like these little details of, you wouldn't even almost notice maybe, but there are these little details of things that make you feel so special. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I watched her for, for a long time and I wanted to emulate her gift Nice. And so that, you know, emulating someone else's gift, if you feel like, oh, I like how this looks and feels, I want to emulate this, but you can't yeah. emulate something if you don't see someone do it. Right. That's and good. so that's a good first step. Yeah, that is good. That is good. I like Watch how us. Sharon was able to maybe even unknowingly just have that kind of impact mm-hmm. on you to make you feel like I want to do this for others. I want right. to prepare a place to make someone feel like they can come into the presence of Jesus and know him. Like you're saying, they might know of him, but maybe they don't have a relationship with him as savior. Yes, absolutely. That's great. Now uh, back to opening our homes. Can you, I want to talk about the, in Genesis 18, where um, Abraham invited three strangers into his tent. Can we talk about what that meant for him and what example he's given us? Yeah, I looked into that a little bit more and um, I loved it. So there are so many commentaries out there about that passage. And so I'm like, okay, what's this all about? Um, It says he saw the Lord and then he, and then it goes through this thing. So a lot of the commentary says one of the men was, was God and the other two were angels. And so I read in context and it most likely was the case that story was the setup for the new covenant and the, and the promise that God had given to Abraham that he was going to be the father of many nations. And so we go into Hebrews 13 and there's a verse that says, um, hosting angels unaware. Mm -hmm. And in that time, I don't think that he was unaware of their presence, but just the idea that he was being obedient in the Bible, um, Breaking bread and having meals with people, having a meal with people, that is a sign of covenant and promise. And so all through the Old Testament and even in Jewish um, in Jewish culture, having a meal with each other is, a sim- is symbolic of the promise of God. And remember, the Jews are still waiting for their Messiah. Well, we already have the Messiah. And this was like that, that Genesis 18, when I read through it, um, I loved it because Jesus, he recognized that God was there to speak to him again. And before that, God had already spoken and said, you are going to have a child. And those angels came in and reaffirmed that he was going to be the father of many nations. We'll be back in a year and you will have born a son from your wife, Sarah. And so what I see in that from when it comes to hospitality was Abraham was charged to obey. And he did, he, 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 invited them in. So he actually hosted the presence of God, literally and figuratively. He was hosting the presence of God. Um, He made a meal. He offered them refreshment. He offered them freshening. So he had, he was ready to clean their feet and wash their feet and offer them rest. Um, And then in turn, he accepted a blessing. And I think that's one of the things we don't associate with, um, hospitality is the offer of blessing. We've, you and I talked a little bit before the podcast about that Southern hospitality. I found while I was in Mississippi, like I grew up with her being so hospitable, our family being very hospitable, um, but never really experienced Southern hospitality. And when we started talking about this Genesis 18, I'm like, wait a minute, it's, it was Jewish tradition and in their culture, it was tradition to bring a blessing when someone hosted you. And so I, that's what I experienced in, in Mississippi. When we would go to someone's house or someone would come to us, they'd always bring a gift. You'd bring a box of chocolates or a plant. 
I did not know people did stuff like this until I was there. And when I read this passage, I'm like, oh my gosh, he accepted a blessing from them that he would be the father of nations. And he accepted that blessing. And we know what happens from there. He has Isaac, which sets the stage for our inheritance into the kingdom. And so when I look at all of that through the eyes of Genesis 18 and then looking into Hebrews 13, um, we're, we're just emulating a tradition that ushers in the presence of God. And I think that's kind of what we hope for, especially now as believers, that when we host people that we're ushering in the presence of God. So that may have gone a totally different direction than what you were no, expecting. <laughs> what, what you did was actually brought it to a spiritual level. Um, you, it's about faith. You know, mm-hmm. Abraham is the father of faith. He That's was right. an example of faith. He was, in his faith, he was obedient. He, you know, there's so many, there's so much in here with the washing of the feet, the breaking of the bread, having the meal, um, and, and getting the blessing by being obedient. Mm -hmm. I think that's in many places in the Bible about getting a blessing, getting the promise of God simply because you're obedient. Yeah. Well, then accepting it too. It can be really tough. I know you probably can uh, relate. Like it's tough to have people come in your house and try to help you when you're hosting. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Think about Mark's mom and she'd want to wash oh, yeah. the dish. She'd be like, no, no, <laughs> well, I don't want anybody to do any cleanup until everybody's had enough to eat. I don't want you to start cleaning up before the food. You know what I mean? Right. Like, people don't clean up while people are still eating. Right. Then they feel like it's over. So eat as much as you want. Keep eating. Keep she eating. doesn't want it to end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not bad enough. I know someone like that who doesn't want parties to end is my husband. Oh, oh then he needs to come to our parties. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He can party all night. <laughs> I love it. Here you are again, opening up your house, opening up your house. Yeah. But understanding that, I think recognizing the purpose of hospitality for Christians, for believers, um, is so important because otherwise we really can, we aren't a social, our society is not open to, we aren't the way we used to be. Showing up at someone's house unexpectedly, um, bringing a gift when we go to someone's house, again, a gift, meaning a little box of chocolates or a card that just says, thank you before you've even gotten a meal. Like we don't practice a lot of the same things with, when it comes to hospitality that they even, you know, practiced 30 years ago, we've just kind of gotten away from that. So I think, oh, and this COVID thing, good gracious, like what COVID thing? About- Shut yeah, what, down. Is, what is that? I don't know. Shutting down the people who are already. Where have I been? Yeah. <laughs> He's just been hosting things anyway. But <laughs> the idea that we've kind of gotten away from. Um, should we have masks on? <laughs> Stop. We're family. Um, so, yeah, we've gotten away from it. I think the part of the thing we've also, we've gotten away from the essence of hospitality, even in the church not, you know, in the big C church, not our specific church in the big C church. Um, I think maybe we've gotten away from understanding what it, what it is all about. And that's where you go back to what you talked about at the very beginning. Um, the difference between doing like hosting a party to do something versus hosting and having hospitality, because it's almost like, I don't want to say it's a command in the word, but it does say, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Like there are lots of verses that might not have to do with hospitality per se, but gathering together with people. And right. we've gotten away from that in our, in our culture a lot. And um, for, I'm sure there are many reasons, but we've gotten away from God a little too. Right. Yeah. And how many people really understand the, why do we, why do we have dinner together when we invite people over? Well, that's an age old tradition that goes back to covenant with people and promise with people. And, um, there's a whole study we could go on and on about it, but, um, getting away from understanding that would be one of the reasons to me why we have gotten away from hospitality as a whole. You had mentioned, um, earlier in one of our conversations that you and your mom 
are like ministers of reconciliation. And that's part of the reason why you're, um, you enjoy uh, being so hospitable. Can you tell me more about that? What that means? Mas- ministers of what reconciliation. Do you, what does that mean to you? Reconciliation. Being ministers of reconciliation. You reconcile yourself to each other. Like you forgive and forget and go on. Well, and also being ministers of reconciliation, that's what we're called to as believers. Yeah. And when you rec- when you understand that you are a minister of reconciliation, that your job is to bring Jesus and salvation to people, um, that would be where that idea, not idea, it is a, it's the Bible. It says we are ministers of reconciliation. And if that doesn't go hand in hand with hospitality, I don't know what does. Mm-hmm. You cannot possibly minister reconciliation to people if you never are with people. And if you never take time with people, if you never opened your home or just even if you opened up being the person who helped others, it doesn't have to even be in your home. It can be at a park. It can be over lunch. It can be, you can ask, can I use a room at the church once a month, whatever, to minister hope and reconciliation. And the reconciliation is between the person and Jesus, the person and God. And we're called to be that for people. And you can't do that if you never gather with people. You can't offer that. Yeah, I think that's good, Angela. And I think it kind of leads us into the discussion about even maybe becoming a small group leader. What do you, yeah. what, what would you say to that? Absolutely. How did you feel about opening your home up as a small group leader? Yeah, that's, that's good. I mean, group leaders are good because they can be examples to others too. And like Angela said, you know, just to get people together to tell them about Jesus, especially people that will come in, you know, that you don't really know, you don't know them. But you have to, like Angela said, you have to be around people, be able to talk to them about about the Lord. You have to be open. I think about, there's a girl down the street from us that I used to teach school with. Um, Her name, well, I won't say her name. (laughs) Her name is Sandy. Sandy. Everyone in my mom's small group is Sandy, so none of them will know who we're talking about. Yes, um, right. Sandy lived down the street for years. I'm like, Mom, you need to, Sandy, you got to get Sandy over here to your house. Mom, you got to get Sandy over because they're about the same age. And huh. um, so now Sandy comes over to my mom's house all the time. And But for a long time, I was like, well, I don't know Sandy. But she is the type that will ride her bike through the neighborhood and invite someone over. And now Sandy comes over all the time. Now Sandy comes to church. Sandy did a freedom group. Like just that. She was my helper. She was her helper. Like, wow. and you know, this is a woman who's very, she's not really outgoing in terms, but when you get her involved in a situation and she will talk and she will share yeah. and she's, she's like, yeah. And just that, you know, being obedient, going back to that obedience helped Sandy step out too. And I believe she's living her best life more so than she has in years. I mean, when she did freedom, freedom just changed her life. It just did. She even still talks about it. And what if you wouldn't have opened your home up? Yeah. So you guys have mentioned freedom a couple times for someone listening who might not know what that is. Can you share with us what that is? Freedom is just what it says. You get free. You're free indeed. When you're free, you're free indeed in Jesus, right? So you just learn about the word and the different ways that you can be free in Jesus, salvation and, and speaking out and talking to others about him and just, you know, getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, just so many things about freedom are just, yeah, it's really a good, good, um, good thing to get involved in. Yeah. It's and good, it's about, is it 10, maybe 10, 12 weeks? And then it ends with a retreat at the end. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We host it at East coast. There's multiple, um, places you can go um, around Brevard County um, right. to be in a study, and we're doing it twice a year, right? Once in the fall, once yeah. in the spring. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and and they could learn more about that on the East Coast website. Right. Yes, yes. If Absolutely. anyone's interested in that, that's um, kind of one of our one step. When we talk about one savior, one step, one soul, one step freedom is one of our one steps, one of our next steps into your walk with Jesus. Mm-hmm. I think some people can be intimidated by being a small group leader or any in any capacity to lead, thinking they don't have the qualifications to lead. Uh, and I know we've talked a lot about stepping out in faith and being obedient and watching someone who you can emulate what they've done. Um, are, are there any other 
um, advice. I'm going to, this will be my final, my final question. Any last thoughts, any advice you can give to someone who is really, really thinking about being like obeying God's command about being a minister of reconciliation and, and opening up and being more with their community. Anything? Can you probably just really be open to the Lord, really be open to his calling for your life. And then also just spend time with him so you can know him. And yeah. then your, your life will show what you've learned about him and he'll be part of you. And that's it just overflows out of you. It's just natural. That's good. So I think that something like that. You yeah. Know. Spending time with the Lord first, like you feel that tug to start, you know, maybe start something, have people in your home, um, make sure you're, you are where you need to be with the Lord, but, um, also recognize that, Hey, if I'm obedient to this, God's going to bring blessing to me through right. this. I mean, gosh, how many times have you been in a small group or hosted a small group and you, when everyone leaves, you feel more filled than the people maybe who even came to that. And then for days later, people are, Oh, thank you so much for opening your home. It was so refreshing. You are not even sure who's going to show up or what the conversation is going to be. And just be, be, you know, willing to be obedient. Yeah. And there's so many things out there to help you like tools, like there's videos, you know, there's, you know, like a lot of times when I, when I, when I first started having things at church and that I used to teach the Beth Moore, I used to have her and I thought she saves my life because you talk and then she gets to talk and she's a real teacher. You know what I mean? You think, <laughs> Oh my gosh. So just the tools you can use that are out there, That's you know, good. different tools, the videos, and even like soap, it's so good. soap. I mean, if you talk to people right now and say, I'm just going to have a few ladies over and do the soap. It's so simple. Because everybody talks, because everybody get, has a verse. You kind of explain to people how it works. And it's just exciting. Now you got to tell us what soap is. I knew you were okay. going to say that. <laughs> soap is, is what we do actually for the, um, the sisterhood. sisterhood. We have um, each day we have, you know, we follow, days we Yeah, follow. we follow a calendar of scripture. And soap stands for scripture. O is observation, application, prayer. Yeah, yeah. And you basically, it's almost like journaling. Yeah, it is. And everyone just kind of shares what God showed them in the word. Um, at East Coast, we have a, a daily radio show called Morning Breath. And we follow through, a, through chapters of the Bible and we just read it and we mm -hmm. talk about what God spoke to us. And that's right. basically what soap is. And she's right. There are so many tools. Like you don't have to be afraid to host something in your home or be step up as a small group leader, because the tools that are available, you don't have to worry. Some of my most, some of the learning that some of the I'm trying to, how am I supposed to word it? The best most time. reading, learning, yeah. best learning that I had was as a group leader, following something that I chose. Like she said, Beth Moore, I wasn't teaching anything. Beth Moore was teaching. I learned so much during that season. I know you did too, yeah. that now it's easier to teach, but I didn't, I wasn't, I just was obedient to, to opening my house. I will never forget at church at East coast, there was a group of young 20 somethings and there really wasn't a lot for them as far as um, Bible studies. A lot of the things were during the day when it was like women were working, um, and a group of us went to the Shine Conference. Um, it was me, Jessica Stahlbaum, Jessica Howard, Leanne Johnson, and a couple other ladies, girls. We went up. We had all just had babies. We got away for the weekend. And while we were sitting there, we were all like, we need to, we need to do something. We need something else for women in our church. And so the Lord was like, you need to do it. And I had just had my third child. And my kids were, I had three kids in three years at home. So I had a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and one-year-old. And God's like, you do it. And that day, Christine Kane um, was at this conference we were at. And she said, get your butt out of the way. <laughs> and when she said that, she was talking about being obedient. Get your butt out of the way. And I was sitting there going, but God, I have three mm. kids. Why do I need to do it? Like I have three kids. I wanted to have someone else do it. Right. And she was like, you just need to do it. You just need to do it. And I'm like, oh my word. So I did. And it birthed this like 
Bible study on Thursday nights. It opened the door. People like Michelle Hughes Davies, Michelle Davies walked in through that door. She worked all day and she said, thank you so much for doing this. I can't go to the study on Tuesday mornings. Mm -hmm. Thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. And so just that simple obedience, getting your butt out of the way, but I can't do it because my house isn't clean, but I can't do it because I'm not smart enough, but I can't do it because my husband won't want me to have people over, but, but get your butt out of the way. Like Christine Kane said, and just do something and God will do the rest. I think that's where we have, we go wrong is we think we're the ones that are doing it. And the bottom line is God's just saying, open your tent, Abraham, and I'm going to come in and bless you. That's all he's saying. Open your tent, Angela, and I'm going to bring people in and I'm going to be the one who changes lives. I'm going to minister through you this, the, the promise of reconciliation. It's nothing about us. And so, right. And then I was thinking about this little old saying that you do the best, you do your best and God will do the rest. Oh. But one thing I want to add to this is hospitality doesn't mean you have to be in your home. I see girls doing the soap at Panera, three or four girls or five or whatever. Call a friend, go to lunch, have some soap. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you don't have to do stuff in your home, home. Like I know it's uncomfortable sometimes for people in their homes. And really, I kind of started doing stuff with the church at my old church in the in the um, one of their hall. rooms, the fellowship hall in the evening time, because just the same reason we'd work in the daytime and then, you know, we'd want women to come at night. So there's a million different things to come up with. And I'm sure the Lord can show each every person what they need to do in their walk. Like, just like she said, God was telling her, if you listen enough, he'll tell you. He'll tell you. So be faithful in prayer. <laughs> That's right. Stay, stay in God. Let's stay with him. So, you know, you know, like you were saying, um, Cindy, that it just will naturally overflow out of you. Uh, yeah. Your walk with him will act, will, will be obvious and apparent on the outside. It's just, yeah. you know, whatever's in your heart is actually is what's going to flow from you and just exactly. get your butt out of the way. That's right. There you go. That's a good one. <laughs> I think we're going to end there. Get your butt out of the way. Thank good you. Good girl. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, I, Jeannie. I'm, I'm just so blessed. I feel like um, me doing uh, this podcast episode with you hopefully is a sign of hospitality that now yeah. someone will be reconciled with their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because of what you guys had to share. Praise God. Mm. Thank you, Jeannie. God Thank bless you. you. God yeah. bless you. Have a great day. You guys yeah. too. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the East Coast Sisterhood Podcast. You can find more information about Sisterhood at eccc.us slash sisterhood. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook. Just search East Coast Sisterhood. 